Welcome to Film Student Study Guide, episode 7. Uh, this episode is over the art of self-defense. Um, came out in 2019, so watch the film before you listen to this. Our next episode next week is a triple feature. We got Nightcrawler, A Face in the Crowd, and Network. Truman says that nope. all of these movies would work together as a triple feature, so... I'll trust him. Well, we will we'll certainly see. We're covering uh, the media industry, specifically uh, the news cycle. And I believe, uh, I'm certain that the second two, Network and Nightcrawler, are, you know, satires. But uh, I have not seen a face in the crowd, but from the description sounds like it'll fit in perfectly so hopefully they make a good triple feature it'll be interesting and even more importantly a, a good podcast episode yeah um, but i say we jump right in to uh one of my favorite films of last year i thought it didn't really get enough credit uh and it was certainly in my top 10 possibly even in my top five um do y'all want to... Actually, I'm interested. Why don't we start this out? Do y'all have a ranking of your favorite films of last year? You know just kind of just forgot to mention? <clears throat> what? We have a special guest <laughs> of Carter. Oh, yeah. So, Howdy. Thank yeah, you for having me on. I, I forgot. Carter of... Uh, Carter uh, Trey Smith of Frog Toad Productions. <laughs> the okay. Frog uh, of Frog Toad Productions. With awards of uh with uh his renowned film that he's promoting uh right now called tony <laughs> and you uh, uh I, I don't remember that uh, <laughs> i wonder why i would pick that movie to discuss i guess <laughs> um but yeah so um Carter, you actually uh, got to meet these people, right? I did. I got to meet the director at South by Southwest, and I also met most of the um, the actors from the night class after the uh, after the showing. Oh, really? What did uh, that's cool? Yeah. What did Jesse Eisenberg sm- smell like? <laughs> uh, I wasn't really focusing on the smell at the time, so I'd have to <laughs> I'd have to recheck to to get back to you on that one. All right, all right. Um, so anyway, I did want to uh, kind of start off the episode. I think it'd be fun. Uh, do y'all have kind of a ranking of uh, your favorite films? Just kind of off the cuff. Doesn't matter if it's really all that exact, but kind of a top five or top ten hmm. of last year. So like you films that came out last year. Yeah, 2019. So we're Ooh. late to the late to the game of the award show trying to remember. episodes. Oh. By five, maybe six months now. Yeah. So, Carter, <laughs> do you have a, do you have some uh, an ordered favorite list? You know, not necessarily perfect. Twenty nineteen. Uh, I think I actually I posted my favorite few films. Oh yeah, I think you did. But I I think I would definitely say that the art of self defense is probably my favorite comedy of 2019 is it a comedy i I would say it's probably a comedy i laughed i mean yeah but i don't really hard in the theater when i I don't think it's necessarily trying to be funny though Hmm. i disagree entirely i think it's trying to be absolutely hilarious and succeeding i've seen it about three times and i was dying laughing through each each viewing huh so i don't know maybe, maybe it's just a comedy to me I mean, there's definitely I, funny parts. I don't know. I just mm-hmm. don't know if it's a comedy. Hmm. I'm pretty sure it's budgeted as a dark comedy. Well, if it's a dark comedy, then yeah, that would make sense. But yeah, hmm. so anyway, Carter, what what were some of your other favorites of last year? Well, I really enjoyed The Lighthouse. That was probably my number one. And then I also really enjoyed Honey Boy. That was another one. That one, um was kind of under the radar a little bit it didn't show at most theaters and then parasite obviously and um yeah. i really enjoyed once upon a time in hollywood 
But this would definitely be okay. in my top ten um, art of self defense. I think say. my list would go something along the lines of like, uh, um, probably like Parasite, The Lighthouse, um, maybe Midsummer, Uncut Gems. Oh yeah, I forgot about that one. Marriage Story and The Art of Self Defense are probably my favorite. Ooh, and also I I felt like The Peanut Butter Falcon didn't get much. That was pretty good. I don't know if much. I would say top ten, but I did like that one a lot. Well, I'm just thinking through, uh, and I think, I mean, it would probably get, like, the 10 or 11 slot, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? But yeah. uh, I think it would be on there. Oh, and also, uh, just a quick plug for Greener Grass, which I believe is on Hulu now. That was also probably in my top 10. That one was probably a little higher, probably around, like, an 8 mm. or something. You know, uh, I I really enjoyed it, and I saw it at uh, the Savannah Film Festival, so I also got to meet those two lovely gals. Hmm. Um, Yeah, Roberto, did you have any ones you wanted to rattle off Um, real quick? I didn't didn't really see a lot of, uh, of like, the 2019 films that every... Like, I tried to watch all of them, but I just didn't get around it. I think I've seen, like, probably half of... Like, all the ones that everybody's just like, oh, go see it, or that went to the Academy Awards. Mm. Um, I mean, pretty much every every one of the films is, is good. <laughs> uh, I, I'm so glad we have you on this podcast, I know. Roberto. I'm glad, too. <laughs> so, uh, I'd say Hobbs and Shaw is probably number the... one, though. <laughs> what? <laughs> Gotta put Hobbs and Shaw at number one. <laughs> My favorite film of the year. Carter, we still haven't watched that. Yeah, we should. Y'all should review it on here. Oh no! <laughs> God, this ah! is the episode in which we do all nine Fast and the Furious films. <laughs> oh no! I can't wait. Oh, I cannot man. wait. That'll be a week. Then you can make a list. I'm s- on best. I'm or worst. super surprised. Oh yeah, that would be the goal. We already did the Spider-Man movies, Carter. <laughs> I know. Yeah, but there's more. There's more Fast and the Furious movies than there are Spider-Man movies. By like two. Cool. Number one being Hobbs and Shaw. <laughs> right. Um, all right. We could we could break it up into halvesies, Roberto, if it makes you feel better. <laughs> like the part first one half part of two. the Fast and Furious series. <laughs> That'd be funny. And the second half. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, so let's jump into what we're really talking about. Roberto, mm. did you have anything you wanted to start off with? You're the host. Um, I think probably the most interesting thing, or, well, the most, something that I found really, like, weird, or, well, weird, I feel like is too strong of a word, but it was, and, like, interesting is maybe, like, Roberto, you're talking like my sister at the dinner table when she tries to summarize anything. I'm sorry. By the way, she's a notoriously terrible summarizer. See, I think I'm a great <laughs> summarizer. I just... Oh, okay. Well, um... <laughs> I found that the dialogue was very simple. Like, a, a, mm. like a, a lot of the like sentences are either just like... They're very, like, cut and dry and to the point. And so, yeah, my question would be here uh, to Carter, actually. Uh, Did anyone bring up Yorgos Lanthimos in the Q&A or in the conversation you had with the directors? Because I very much thought that this dialogue sounded exactly like Yorgos Lanthimos dialogue. Um but a little bit less to the extreme. Uh, I don't think anyone did in the Q and A. I remember the Q and A being pretty short, but um, yeah, I don't oh, think okay. anyone did bring that up. But uh, yeah, it is kind of like that. Just that kind of surreal dialogue of just saying exactly what's going on and kind of just very bland and cut and dry. But that's what makes it funny and surreal, you know. What's your gross? Yeah, and staccato. Uh, Yorgos Lanthimos, which I might be butchering his name. 
He did um, The Lobster, The Favorite, um, uh, The Killing of a Sacred Deer, and Dog Tooth. Uh, Dog Tooth. Yeah. Okay. Which, Carter, have you seen Dog Tooth yet? I haven't. I really need to, though. Okay, it's probably ones, my favorite Yorgos. Yeah, I've heard it's really good. Yeah. See that one. Um, it's on Criterion. <laughs> you have my password, bro. <laughs> I know. I know it. Shut up, baby. I know it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so uh, the my favorite thing to highlight with this staccato dialogue actually is um those office worker scenes oh those are the those best. were those were some of my favorite parts of this movie i'm gonna say I was dying laughing uh, the whole time that those came up every time uh yeah when they're talking about sex positions <laughs> that yeah. was hilarious like we should do push-ups so <laughs> and great, we dude. should do push-ups <laughs> so great um and then the other one that i loved is the continuing uh lack of naming of uh that new restaurant in town they always just call it that new restaurant in town <laughs> when of course in natural dialogue you'd you know you'd say like the name of the restaurant or yeah. something like that you know what i mean yeah. so i just thought it was ridiculous that they would never that they refuse to name the new restaurant in town i love writing like that it's kind of like I don't know. It, if you look into it enough, it feels lazy, but it's definitely not. You know, it just kind of, it, it's ironic almost. Just making fun of actually like going through on scripts and like trying to like name the restaurant and making sure that, the, you know, the viewers know that's the restaurant name. Instead of that, they just, you know, mess around and uh, just say it's the new restaurant. And yeah. I love that. Yeah, I'm. I'm definitely going to argue that it, it isn't lazy as yeah. well. I'm going to agree with you there because, I mean, we just keep throwing Slappy's seafood, which <laughs> you originated and now I've adopted because I love Slappy's seafood. Uh, and, you know, anytime I need a restaurant name, I'm, of course, going to use Slappy's seafood. <laughs> yeah. I can't I mean, wait. You know, it's, it's like I can't an wait till we're all, of. like, Years in the future, and there's one of us like directs some like big budget movie, and and someone is just like, oh yeah, Slappy Seafood, <laughs> or, Slappy or Seafood something. Cinematic Universe. <laughs> yeah, like uh, like what Quentin Tarantino did with uh, Red Apple Cigarettes oh, and yeah. uh, Kahuna Big Burger? Kahuna Burger. Yeah, and I think he has some other ones in there, but I, I don't probably. know. Um. But yeah, I I love how honestly that that creates this fan theory that all of those films take place <laughs> in the same world. Right. When in all likelihood, he just probably wanted to keep adding the same brands as like an inside joke, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. I can't imagine that it was all an elaborate scheme to make sure all these films take place in the same universe. Right. But I could be wrong. I agree. It'd be interesting you. if um, it does, though. True. Yeah. I mean, it is so, cool uh, to kind of have those theories out there still. <coughs> Certainly. Uh, we talked about that a little bit in one of our previous episodes. Mm. Um, I, I did want to bring up... Um, I don't think this film rewards multiple viewings. Because uh, I watched it for a second time in preparation for this podcast. Mm. Um, and, of course, when I first watched it, it was in a theater. So the laughter is going to be a lot louder in a theater on a big screen with more people, you know, when you're sharing the laugh. Right. Um, but I, I think also some of the comedy wore off because I don't think the jokes get funnier over time. And uh, I also think that, um, you know, you see it all coming now. Yeah. And right. so I, mean, I don't think this movie is a, a multiple viewing film. Whenever I was watching uh, this movie the first time, like, I could, I could definitely, like, sort of tell what was going to happen from, like, even the very, like, first scene. Mm-hmm. Like, it... it 
There, re- there wasn't really, like, much mystery or anything like that. It, or, like... I, I would I argue know, like, that I that's could... not the point, though. Well, it's labeled as a mystery. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Huh. That's weird. I would say, like, comedy drama, maybe. Yeah. That's I'm going full dark comedy. There was a lot of comedy. Um... I do want to say, I think the highlight of this film, uh, and I think almost everybody would agree with this, other than, of course, those office worker conversations, mm. uh, which I love, is the ending, which uh, we can drop in that same sound effect if we want, Roberto, I mean, of spoiler I, alert. I, I did it in the beginning. I said, if you if watch, watch the movie before you before you see the episode, I yeah and this is definitely a movie um, to go see like this is a really good movie i i certainly agree uh, but at the watch. same time i'm gonna uh i'm gonna argue that uh we haven't talked about a film that you shouldn't see <laughs> <laughs> Fair. except maybe amazing spider-man 2 just because <laughs> what's the need yeah um, well, if if you see that movie, you can see uh, some CG teeth get uh, pushed together by electricity, and that's <laughs> it's a sight. It's definitely a sight. Um, but uh, I I think the ending where they just build and build and build till he just shoots him. Yeah. It's great. Really comes out of nowhere. Great plot twist. And I think it matches really well with their foreshadowing, which certainly does not seem... You know, I didn't notice that the gun store was foreshadowing until I watched it the second time Mm. to really see that 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 gun store is just a plot device. I I kind of saw it as that at first. Like, thinking that it was going to be used later. But since it's so early in the movie, I pretty much forgot about it by the end. And I was like, oh, wait. The gun store from the beginning. <laughs> so it was kind of like... Yeah. Yeah. I felt like that was kind of the only big reveal, though. Like, the other ones were kind of expected. Yeah. Yeah, I I mean, I had no surprise when I found out that he had the tapes of all the... Um, no. I mean, all that, you know, all that stuff is yeah. sort of alluded to throughout the movie. And you get, like sort of this uneasy feeling throughout the entire movie of, of like whenever uh the female character is being like oh the night class or people are just talking about the night class and the one dude is like mm-hmm. oh the red tape is for you kill someone and he's like no nah, i'm just kidding they're teachers right like mm-hmm. at, in that moment i was like wow wouldn't it be really funny if that was actually if they killed someone that would be oh yeah. boy like i said i was like thinking that and then later in the movie it becomes true i'm like oh okay or like even with the gun thing like whenever um whenever he calls whenever the gun store calls him and he's like your gun is ready and then he's like oh i don't want a gun anymore it's like well the paperwork is is still going to be valid for another six months i'm like that'll come mm-hmm. back in the later part of the film I'm like why, yeah. why else did you they... really think that yeah <laughs> that's that's really well done well done then <laughs> I commend you. I mean, why else would they um, mention that? Like, there, there's no... There, it doesn't... I don't know. I It just, like... I don't know. Maybe my brain was doing a little bit of overwork today. But I could sort of just, like, see through the movie and know what was going to mm-hmm. happen. Um, the other thing uh, that I wanted to bring up that really caught me off guard was the opening scene. I thought the opening scene really set a great tone for the film. And, you know, I love it when a film is able to hook you so well from an opening scene. Um, But I think that punchline of him learning French, you know, in the car is, you know, that one was one of the, probably one of about five punchlines that still hit me the second time Mm. of even though i was like oh he's gonna get in the car he's gonna get in the car i was like shit that was funny Mm -hmm. yeah Um, i like how much of it like shows how he's a loser in the beginning it really sets the mood for what kind of person he is where he doesn't like he already knows french but he doesn't uh 
like do anything to stop them from saying all that stuff. He just lets it happen to him. Yeah. I think it kind of sets up that motif of like defense, you mm-hmm. know, and standing up for yourself, which of course he's going to learn through the film. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was a pretty um, good opening. I also what did y'all think about, you know, the whole ideas about masculinity and femininity that were brought up in this movie? Um, I, I really enjoyed the, uh, the themes behind that. I, I wrote down here that I felt like it was a criticism of the social pressures towards men to ask, to act masculine. Yeah. And, um, I, I, I really enjoyed it because I, I kind of, I've seen that before and I've felt that way before of people wanting to, um, you know, like, oh, well I have to act this way so I can be more manly. You know, I have to do this. And I think that was a something that I haven't really seen in other films before, a kind yeah, of I mean, topic that was tackled. The entire thing is, uh, I don't know the sensei, uh, or I guess Leslie, uh, his like entire thing <laughs> is that you need to do these things to become more manly, and you need to stop doing mm-hmm. these other things so you, that you can become less feminine, right? And right. there's like, oh, it's strict path, and you need to follow the rules, and the rules are the dojo rules, right? Um, but one <clears> of the <throat> rules is like, that's shown in the beginning of the movie, but for some reason isn't brought back at the end. Um, is like w- do whatever works. Like because mm-hmm. he has like this whole speech in the very first speech. Whenever he goes into the dojo, is do whatever works to like win or survive or whatever. Mm-hmm. And that's what he ultimately does. Like although, like he uh, he uses a gun, he does whatever he needs to get by, right? And right. it. The entire, I feel like the entire thing is sort of, it says that it's so like dumb to limit yourself to these specific things and you should, like limiting your ideas to a certain pathway is, I'd, I, I feel like the, the female character says this at some point during the movie. Um, my favorite uh, thing about this is when the female character uses it against them and says, you know, females can hear higher pitch sounds <laughs> much before men can. Right. And they're all like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, oh, you, you must be true. You must be correct. Um, but uh, I definitely thought it was a good, honest uh, criticism. Um and uh shoot i had something i wanted to bring up about it um but i i i forgot Hmm. nice it'll be fine oh yeah so great uh i love it when this happens um Um, shoot so one of the things that was discussed at a at the south by viewing that i saw was that they said that um, the character who played Sensei or Leslie was brought on a week before they started shooting. Really? Yeah, <laughs> which is insane to me because, in my opinion, he, he did the best out of any other character in this in this film. I think I think there are three really pivotal characters that really make the movie, mm-hmm. uh, and of course that's uh, the the lady character Jesse Eisenberg and the Sensei. Right. Um, yeah, they're really the I think, three stars of the film. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other thing is, is I really think that dynamic between Jesse Eisenberg and the sensei is really the, you know, the, the axis of the film. Yeah. That kind of... You know, there's this kind of idea, I think, that was presented um, in some kind of film essay I watched about maybe The Dark Knight possibly yeah um where uh they talked about how the reason why the dark knight works so well is because every villain you know if you're gonna have a movie with a direct villain the villain should represent everything that's opposite of the hero Mm -hmm. and so when batman represents order and justice and rules uh, the Joker represents anarchy and um, evil and all of that jazz, right? And that's right. why 
that works so well. And I think that's the same case here with Jesse and Leslie of, you know, he represents the typical alpha male and <laughs> Jesse represents the typical, you know, uh, beta male. Um, right. All of it's that. And Sal and Chad. That's what it is. <laughs> You know all of the all of the nasty names the internet wants to come up with them. Yeah. I agree. Um, uh, I also okay. So I I remembered what I wanted to bring up. I I like that this is almost a, a parody of uh, karate in uh, its rules and its teachings. Mm-hmm. Um, because, uh, have y'all ever taken karate classes? No. I haven't. You ha- neither of y'all? No. Okay, um, well, I used to do, uh, some karate, uh, I think I did karate in, like, two places. <laughs> um, I never rose past green belt. Um, but I think I got a green belt in one place, but I think possibly green belt was the second layer. Uh, and I think I got to like, you know, a yellow belt with three pieces of tape or something like that at another place. Mm-hmm. And, um, was one of anyway, the, was the big, one of the pieces of tape that you killed someone. I, I don't think I, I told you all this yet, but yeah, we we would ride out in the night on motorcycles when I was in second grade, and we'd go just murk people in the street. I used my, my skills of kibun, which anybody who's taken karate uh, instantly know, should know that joke of kibun is like the first... Um, set of moves you learn which is step step punch turn around step step punch hmm. something along those lines i think i can Im- i can um, i can see it in my head like of like what this would look like because i feel like this is like the classic thing that people just always do in movies hmm. yeah it's something along you, you know you gotta get your stance right with your uh with your hands at your waist in punching form, right? Uh, but turned upside down, and you gotta, you know, step in a crouched position. It's kind of funny and ridiculous. Uh, but anyway, the the thing that I wanted to bring up is that in these uh, dojos that I studied in, uh, which the first one I studied in was just a, a rented out. Um, a gymnasium of a school after school or something like nice. that. Mm. It was a that one was a, a real ridiculous, somewhat mess of a karate class. But uh, then in in Kentucky, I had a real good karate teacher named Master Din, <laughs> and like, dude, that karate dojo was kind of like the thing of the town. It was a daycare Ooh. center. It was a, uh, it was the place where everybody had their birthday parties. Like, that was the coolest place in town. Huh. Um, and that's not really saying much about the town, I must say. <laughs> about where Kentucky. It? Where was? It? <laughs> uh, it was uh in Murray, Kentucky. Oh. Uh, nice. tiny little town. I bet. Uh. Basically, it was it was either it was either uh, Master Din's dojo or uh, Victor's sub shop that were the coolest spots in town. Oh, and they also had like one of the original Dairy Queens or something like that. <laughs> Not bad. So a whole bunch of like stupid uh, South Town things that are like, well, we were this historical thing for this reason. Um, but anyway, uh, what the point that I've been trying and trying to get to is there's so much in those karate classes where they're not talking about karate at all. They're talking Mm -hmm. about like respect and, you know, the rules of the dojo and all about that. And it's, you know, this kind of 
you know, trying to teach the whole person and all of that. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I think that's in some ways pretty ridiculous and stupid. Um, in some ways it's somewhat relevant, you know, when it's the hottest spot in Murray, Kentucky, I see why they did that, (laughs) you know, of like, where else are they going to learn about respect? Other How old than are you in their tiny little podunk? Huh? What? How old were you going to this? I was in second grade. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think the second grade karate would be a little different from like an actual karate class. Yeah, but at the same time, it's like teach me karate. I don't need to learn all about respect and all that. They you can't know, have all the kids time. just going to kick the shit out of each other. You know, you gotta you gotta give them a little discipline. I never once hit anything other than a board the punching bags or the air i think that's that's probably for the best for a second grader though (laughs) (laughs) you know i wanted to spar so bad (laughs) you just have second graders like hitting each other as hard as they can (laughs) well you've got when you spar you have a whole bunch of like that was the one thing that, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, I think this film got somewhat wrong, is that I'm pretty sure no one spars with, like, no padding whatsoever or anything right. like that. I'm, you know, and especially, like, the night classes are ridiculous. Well, no one would be doing that kind of stuff. That also just Especially with like- no padding the purpose of the class of like the class though and like or like the purpose of the the dojo is like to show how like absurd this is or that like from the beginning that something is wrong or that something is off right yeah that makes sense all right yeah i mean she choked out that kid in the first (laughs) 10 minutes of the film (laughs) and then she's like tap out or uh whatever it is Remember the rules like tap out or take or nap out? Yeah, tap out or nap out. <laughs> yeah, that was. So and, and all the parents yeah, are fine. About that. Like they were just like, uh huh, yep. <laughs> and then like the kid just drops on the floor. And then that was interesting because then later, uh, whenever she's fighting uh, the one uh, the black belt person, and she like beats him up, like he starts, she has him in the chokehold and like he's tapping out and she just doesn't do anything. Like he he's yeah. still she still chokes him out yeah I, I just think overall it's it's really funny the way they parody the whole idea of karate classes mm-hmm. teaching the whole of karate uh, and of course this is shown through those rules on the board everybody's got those rules on the board uh, <laughs> it even reminded me of the rules on the board in uh, Gallagher's class <laughs> Roberto <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, I've said, I, I think I've said either to myself or uh, out loud that if I ever teach a film class, I'm going to go three times as hard as Gallagher did on those exact rules. What do you mean? Dude, when I broke, I, ro- I broke those rules all the time. One of uh, those by rules, the way, is these not, rules is don't vape. So... No, 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 no. I'm talking about other of the rules. The rules on the board that were like, if you turn it on, turn it off. <laughs> if you break it, fix it. If you don't know how to work something, ask. Ben, you know, you I think it, it was like, it? uh, yeah. Or pay like for just it. the student tries to fix it. Well, it I had to up? fix. I had to fix uh, a crazy lighting set. Like, Gallagher just sent me in there in a 20-minute fit session, right? Mm. And he was like, if you want to use those lights, you better fix them. Um, <laughs> which I didn't break them. You didn't even break them. <laughs> they were, I didn't even break them. And I had never worked with lights before. And I went in there so clueless, just unscrewing everything. Oh, my God. And I ended up. I think I ended up wrecking some stuff worse than they were before, but in the more. end, uh, in the end, we got those those lights to work, uh, mm-hmm. and that's how we lit some of uh, stage seven. <laughs> um, do you remember those big bulk, bulky lights I had? Oh yeah, I did. yeah. Were I think they, they the were Aries? like three fifties or something. The Ari lights? Uh, no, they weren't. They weren't the LEDs. 
that your your dad donated, Roberto. They yeah. were the the big bulky. Yeah, the Ari ones. Guys that hang from the ceiling. Uh, yeah, they were the same ones as the ones that hang from the ceiling yeah. in our class. The um, the just straight up tungsten bulbs. Yeah, the Ari's. Um, but anyway, those uh those rules. I think they're um, uh, st- uh, Kubrick's rules. That he had on his set. <laughs> uh, and it was called, like, the 10-minute film school or something like that. Um, but anyway, so, you know, those rules reminded me a lot. And then the other thing is, is, like, when he talks about, you know, listening to metal music, developing masculine hobbies, as much as it mm-hmm. does talk about, you know, masculinity, I think the other thing it's really talking about is that parody of, you know, karate classes teaching, you know, how to be a person when they're, you know, I don't feel that these people really have any qualification on, you know, guidance counseling or anything like that. They have qualification in karate. So it's interesting that they're, you know, just seems like what, (laughs) you know, because my dad teaches that. And he studied and has a master's degree in sports psychology, mm-hmm. which is basically uh, teaching, you know, uh, people how to be good humans. Uh, I think there's more to I'm I don't have a full grasp or a full understanding because I'm not the master's degree holder in the household. Um, but anyway, I just think it's overall funny that these people are teaching how to be a, a human and they have no qualifications uh, in that sense. And so it really doesn't matter what they're teaching because they're just teaching what they think is right. And, you yeah. know, so to parody really it in the way of him. like it to parody in the way of going fully on the opposite end and teaching something that's actively wrong, you know, I think right. that's funny. And I think, this film would not have worked 20 years ago for this reason. You know what I mean? I don't think think there was 20 years ago either. (laughs) Well, yeah, but also I think that concept of like toxic masculinity wasn't as prevalent 20 years ago. No, I mean, mean, when fight club talked about it, that was when fight club brought it up. That was insane. No one had seen anything like that before to the best of my knowledge. Right. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, in a way that I don't think they needed to really be taking a stance or parodying that, um, e- even though they are, to make the joke work that I think they're going for. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. The other thing that I've uh, found funny is that they're all about like being masculine and everything, and then in the in the night class they're like, okay, now it's time to wind down. And then they all stretch <laughs> naked together. <laughs> yeah. That there, was... wasn't, there wasn't a lot of homoerotic elements in this film. Like, um, I watched this with two other people who hadn't seen it before. And they constantly thought that um, the sensei was going to was gonna make a move on Jesse oh, yeah. Eisenberg. Yeah, I had this. I, I was like, is it? Is it, is it going to happen? Mm. Or like, yeah. like. He was like, it says it's your first time uh, in the night class. You won't wind down with the group. Exactly. Come with me. That's what I was and then thinking. we're just like, mmm. That's then, exactly what I was thinking. And then he, and then he uh, gives him to the girl in the closet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I do like, think that was a really her. good... That was a, a really good classic... Um, uh, what's the name? Um... I used to call it a fake out, but I think there's a a more uh, like actually to the study of comedy term uh, terminology to it. Hmm. Uh, Subversion of expectations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Right. In that he's building it up to be like, I want to let you know you're no different from anybody else. Everybody had to go through this. I'm really (laughs) sorry to do this. And you're like, oh, no. (laughs) <laughs> what's it gonna be yeah and he uh, this is gonna be bad yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah and then it's just like the girl in the closet which is like really like weird and mean that they like treat her like that and that she's been there since the like she was a kid and she's still like 
not as good as someone else who hasn't been there as long when she can clearly beat them. Like, mm-hmm. it's... Yeah. And I feel like that goes to, like, serve the whole toxic masculinity thing. Or, like, oh, yeah. just because that this person is a female that they can't do the same things as... And it's just, like, weird. And yeah, you can totally agree. see how that's, like, warped her whole perspective, her whole life perspective. Mm-hmm. Like, she thinks that he still has all this power, like, oh, he'll kill me if uh, if you do that. She says that near the end. Like, if, yeah. if, uh, if I try to leave, he'll kill me. Yeah. Or kind of she'll... A very uh, abusive she, relationship. She keeps telling Jesse Eisenberg to, like, quit the classes and to leave. Yeah. Which I always found, like... If, if anyone tells you that... Like, I feel like it's probably not the best idea to keep going with it. Like, if some of the people, like, in Chaos, when I was in AV1, were like, Chaos sucks, don't do it. I would probably be like, okay, well, I guess I won't. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I think I think we're hitting on the classic don't go in the closet idea of, you know, movies, you know. Like, specifically, like, slasher movies with Don't Go in the Closet. Like, don't you open that door. Don't you open that door. You know, of course, oh, yeah. anytime someone's going to say, hey, you shouldn't you shouldn't stick with this. You know, you don't want no part of this. Uh, which is a quote directly from uh, Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I almost... Uh, I also wanted to bring up, I feel like, you know, as we've been recounting some of the best jokes in this, this movie, it, it strikes me that in a way, this is like an offbeat indie Will Ferrell movie, because there are so many quotable moments, and, you know, the way that Will Ferrell's movies work so well is because it's just line after line after line that are just quotable referenceable you know landmark jokes Mm -hmm. and i I think this movie kind of works in the same way um but maybe just for a newer generation i'd probably say because i feel like i don't know if i showed this movie we'll think about showing this movie to your grandpa i don't think that i don't think older generations would really understand the comedy in this film i think which which my grandpa would love this movie you think (laughs) i think both of my grandpas would like this movie okay i don't know i think one more than the other though (laughs) i don't know i just wouldn't (laughs) but i don't know i i have older generations i I agree with your point i just i I was just thinking you know aloud of Mm -hmm. like what what would my grandparents say to this movie? <laughs> well, maybe you got some you got some cool ass grandparents then. <laughs> really I don't think my grandma sense. would be very into this. Oh, my grandma would not would not like it. I don't think <laughs> she she very much would probably say at some point. Oh, they're not talking very nice. <laughs> 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 You know, some some classic grandma stuff. Right. Or, like whenever the sensei just uh, breaks his arm, like the other way. He's like, oh, Lord. <laughs> Turn this off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. The old turn this off. <laughs> the bane of any filmmaker's existence. The turn you this off. You happy? <laughs> <laughs> I could go for something cheerful. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, think, I think a lot of the comedy leans very like m- leans very millennial and Gen X. I, I would definitely agree with that. I think it very much knows its audience and plays to mm-hmm. its audience, which is a uh, certainly not a bad thing. If anything, I think it's a strength. Yeah, to know what your audience is looking for and and give it to them. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um. Carter, you had some other notes. Did you do you have anything else you wanted to bring up? Um, I felt like the uh, or how did you all feel about the shots in the movie? And the cor- um, not the choreography, the um, cinematography. Um, I feel like there's a couple interesting ones that are mainly that were mainly based around the framing that sort of mm-hmm. gave like a foreshadowing of certain things. But right. like, uh, I liked. 
I liked any of the slow zooms. Mm-hmm. I liked those I when like they the, decided to go for that. Like in the inserts, whenever it was slowly zooming as he was like punching at the screen. You know yeah. what, what I'm talking about? Yeah, I think so. Um, but overall, I, I thought there was definitely some like symmetry and, you know, people in the middle of the frame. Mm-hmm. Very, ooh, he's going to say it. He's going to say it. Wes Anderson. Right. Um. Uh, and I, I really do think, though, it, it I think this film, I, I would definitely like to ask these the creators of this film their thoughts on Yorgos Lanthimos and if mm-hmm. they're very inspired by him. Because overall, I just saw so much influence of Yorgos in, in the shots um, and in the um, dialogue. You know, dialogue, yeah. uh, not as much in the structure, I don't think. Certainly I, yeah. in the surrealism. I, I think it's a, a, in some ways, a more accessible Yorgos idea. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I really would be interested to hear what they have to say about Yorgos. And mm-hmm. I would be extremely surprised if they said, who's that? Yeah. Um. They also might say the the thing of, uh, you know, uh, Carter, I don't know, have you ever felt that, uh, you know, right after you make a movie or something like that, someone's like, oh, this is exactly like, does yeah. anyone ever do that to you? That's pissed me off before when people do that, I, like compare, compare your work to just somebody else. That's like, you kind of feel like you copied it, even though you didn't. It's like, yeah, oh. I, I almost punched a wall. <laughs> when I heard that uh, surprise, which I don't know if I ever showed you, I watched Carter. It. I did. Uh, okay, uh, was a, a remake of After Hours, <laughs> uh, and when I finally watched After Hours, I realized that they were entirely right, <laughs> and I had just made a not as good After Hours when <laughs> my real influences oh. were Pineapple Express and The oh Big Lebowski right. for that movie. So I, I, you know, I thought it was, you know, that was really annoying. So I wonder if they have that feeling as well. Roberto, have you ever had that feeling? Um, not particularly, but I definitely know what you're talking about. Like I've, I've, I've definitely like had conversations with other people or um where like that sort of thing comes up or whenever I've I'm like talking to someone about an idea and then someone else is like, Oh, you mean exactly like this? That's this other worst. thing that someone else has already created and you're like, Oh fuck. Like I can't <laughs> <laughs> I mean as much as that sucks, I think it sucks even worse when you've already made the film. Oh, a hundred percent. Because then you've already gone through it, and you're like, I actually really like this. And you're like, well, this other thing just does what I did, but better, and it's mm-hmm. or worse, and it's in a, or and it's more popular than yours. Yeah. So, so it was annoying. Yeah, I, Roberto. I can did imagine you have pain. Roberto? Did you have another uh, note or question you wanted to bring up? Um, we haven't talked about the end at all. We did a little bit. No, I know, but we haven't like, like okay. When it, whenever your... he like addresses the class, and he fucking mm. g- gets his dog to murk the person who murdered <laughs> his dog. That was funny. That was great. <laughs> or um. with the dialogue with the um, with the doctor is like it's really weird. Like you, your dog was definitely looks <laughs> oh. like it's. Oh, that was one of the biggest laughs. But it looked laughs. like a kick. I I don't understand it. <laughs> that was that was probably one of the ones that got me the most. Every time uh, yeah. that I watched the it, the doctor played that so well. Oh yeah, <laughs> like his facial expressions and the way that he like delivered it. <laughs> He's like, I don't want to upset you, but <laughs> <laughs> but it, I, I I just I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> the other the other line that I really liked that was uh, similar uh, and the you know the other guy that I thought really played it well was uh, the gun store owner because the gun <laughs> oh, yeah. store owner almost didn't play into that same uh, style of dialogue that everybody mm-hmm. else was. I mean, I think if 
you look back on that scene, he really does not fit the same dialogue that I think pretty much every single other person has. Mm. Um, even though when you, if you were to just take some of the lines out of context, I really think they fit that same idea, but he decided to play it somewhat differently. And somehow I think it still really works well. And, um, I think specifically it all leads up to that final line of that sequence of you're going to love owning a gun. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. Like it increases suicide by like three times or or <laughs> whatever. It's like, do you own any kids? No. Okay. Well, then you wouldn't worry about like your kids getting shot. Then. <laughs> yeah. I loved whenever he called him back and he was a uh, he was asking for a woman named Casey. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, wait, oh, that's yeah, the other thing of like the the whole thing of that he has like a woman's name or that he's like very feminine. Right. And then when that comes back to bite the sensei in the butt of yeah. I called you by your name Leslie because I think it would anger you because <laughs> it's actually a very effeminate name more effeminate than Casey one might say I love that I love the dialogue yeah. like that it's like yeah, they're trying because, to act smart but they're yeah not. but it's also like that goes back to the first thing that I said if it's like it's very like simple and like cut and dry and there's no like right like it's just very straight into the point and it's sort of like it sort of just feels like awkward in a way um mm. i i i think that final scene when Jesse Eisenberg does the whole monologue of i thought long and hard about the things i was going to say to you after i killed <laughs> you you know and making right. fun of that whole classic movie idea of saying that cool thing right after you kill somebody or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I definitely, uh, I was reminded of that when I was watching, I don't know if y'all have heard of or seen Middle Ditch and Schwartz, um, but it's this new uh, improv series that's on Netflix Mm -hmm. of uh, three improv specials. Really, really, it's very impressive. Uh, I think the first episode is, like, by far the best episode. Um, But they do what they call long-form improv, where they do a whole skit with a beginning, middle, and end, you know, um, full plot structure and everything that's all improv over the course of, like, 40 or 50 minutes. Um, so it's real cool and real impressive, but they, they do a lot of jokes about the whole, you know, could you say, did you say something cool right after you killed him, uh, specifically Mm. in the first episode. Um, so highly recommend checking out that first episode specifically if you're about all that. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I like how right. that kind of compared it to um, him being like, you know, the badasses on TV who do all that stuff. And that's kind of what he wants to be is just the classic masculine character. That's just a badass and shoots people and says, like, something cool to say right afterwards, you know, mm-hmm. is what he was aiming to be. Right. Um, did y'all have uh, other comments that you wanted to bring up? Um, another thing that I found interesting that I just thought about is whenever uh, Jesse Eisenberg is telling uh, Sensei about like him getting mugged, uh, since it says something like, um, you'll become like whatever you fear, or mm. like that, which, and which is interesting because like they did that to him and then he becomes that to someone else and like right then in the end he kills like it's it's a whole like cyclical thing mm-hmm. which is sort of interesting huh. yeah i, I, I like when movies are able line. to i i do like when movies are able to you know make that sort of cyclical gesture mm-hmm. uh and all of that this is gonna be the worst episode i'm gonna say <laughs> I'm oh, just yeah? officially declaring it. Why is that? No reason. Just this is the worst one. 
I, I think all of our points, we haven't really had any disagreement. We've had a lot of, I really like this. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, like, even the, <laughs> even the whole thing of, um, like, whenever you guys, like, thought it was a comedy, and I didn't really, like, agree that it was a comedy, and then you guys started bringing up some of the funnier points, I'm like, oh, yeah, that was funny. I just... And like I feel like I would probably laugh at that now, and I laughed at when and, and I laughed at it when you told uh, told it to me, and then I brought up some of the uh, other funny things, but during the movie I didn't laugh at all, and like now like maybe it actually is a funny movie, and I just didn't laugh the first what? time. But did you know. watch it alone? Yes. I think yeah, I think this is a movie to watch with friends, is what I definitely yeah say. I agree because like even though this was my third viewing of the film i watched it with two other people who hadn't seen it and i was still laughing at watch all the it jokes because with... like we were all laughing at it together so Truman did you watch says... it with cortez and amelia yeah okay and they loved it too. i'm glad they've seen it so I, truman yeah, says yeah, that i think you it's don't... something to laugh along with truman says they don't glean anything from a second viewing and you've watched it three times now so what do you think mm-hmm. um i don't know if i exactly gained anything i still laughed at most of the jokes Maybe not as much as I did the first time, but I think like showing it to other people is the thing to do if you've seen it once already. Like watching it with some of your friends, because then you're like, oh shit! Like the really funny part's gonna come up, and we're all gonna laugh, you know? <laughs> and um, <laughs> I think that's that's really where this this movie is strong is like laughing with other people and just watching it for fun. Another thing, I, I actually am gonna bring this up because uh, we talked about this in an earlier episode with. Uh, When I brought up Sorry to Bother You and Sorry to Bother You's trailer, the reason why I suggested watching this movie for the podcast is because the Hulu trailer uh, that I kept seeing while watching uh, Rick and Morty or whatever um, was uh, it just really well done. It was like, oh, right, I forgot how funny that movie is. I should watch that again. Mm -hmm. Um and so I, I wanted to just hit on the fact that I think this movie did a great job with its trailer. Because when I saw the trailer multiple times before I saw the movie, uh, you know, I, I really got the idea of what type of movie this was going to be. Right. And it really set the tone well in a way where I, it didn't give away its best punchlines, but it set up what style of humor it had and gave me a laugh from the trailer uh, and just overall, I applaud it for being a really well marketed film, uh, mm-hmm. and you know, being on par with what it promised. And I get annoyed when either the trailer is better than the movie in some cases, yeah, uh, which Entourage mm-hmm. makes fun of in the later seasons, um, or when um, when the trailer is just not when I watch the movie and it's like, this is not at all what the trailer, w- this is not the movie the trailer was advertising right. for. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, I think that's what happened with Scott Pilgrim. That's why it tanked at the box office. Cause <coughs> the trailers were really poor. It didn't fit the movie at all. Well, but what's interesting is I always, when I saw those trailers, I remember when that movie came out, uh, and I wasn't allowed to see it at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, anyway, I, I, I think I got exactly what I expected from the movie. So I, I honest, I somewhat disagree with your point, but at the same time, you're right because time has told us that you're right. You know, there's a reason why it's a mm-hmm. cult favorite and not a mainstream hit, you know, right. and it's likely because of the branding because... I mean, I showed that movie to my grandma, and she loved it. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's, that's one weird. of the few that I've I've shown to my grandma that she she really enjoyed. Uh, that was weird. She did not like Raising Arizona. Really? What? That's Why? so weird. She did not like Raising Arizona. Why? Too mean. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny because my mom's favorite movie is Raising Arizona. And I showed my mom and dad Scott Pilgrim, and they were just not about it at all. <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, at the same time, your mom also loves the same movies that I do. Your mom and I have the same taste in movies. True. And I think I would get along better with your mom than you do if my, your mom and I 
had a nice one-on-one conversation about film. <laughs> what are you implying? <laughs> I'm implying exactly <laughs> what I mean. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm implying that I would be a better son to your mother than you are. <laughs> and I think you have no argument with that. Well, if she ever holds auditions, I'll hit you up. Um. <laughs> but you may you may be right. <laughs> oh. But yeah. Um All right, it's a it's getting to be that time. Uh do we want to do some closing remarks? I mean, it'll be a little early, but I don't see anything wrong with making this one a little bit of a shorter episode. I see no problem either. So, do we have closing remarks? Um, well, if I've learned anything from this is watch it with a group of friends, which might be hard mm. right now, but just wait, <laughs> I guess. I I actually probably will do that at some point. Mm-hmm. Now that you've brought mm-hmm. it up, I might want to go through and watch it again with someone else, like my sister or a friend just to, like, to see if I see it differently. Right. Uh, was there anything else you learned from the inside scoop, Carter, that you wanted to bring up? Ooh, yeah. Um, I did learn that, um, the band that he plays, the death metal band. Yeah. The, the director had his number, um, had the band's number at the time and he called them and he was like, Hey, I was wondering if uh, I could use, um, use your music in, uh, in my film. And they were like, dude, we just watched your other film like a few days ago, and we loved it. <laughs> and so I he should, was able to get the rights like really easily. I should. I didn't realize they had another film. Have you seen it or heard anything about it? Um, let me here. Let me look up his name. I forgot it. Um, I know that he has two other films. He's from Austin as well. Really? Oh, Austin. really? Yep. His That's name is cool. Riley Stearns. Yep, I'm looking up his stuff. Did Fault He's got a death metal cup. shirt on in his in his <laughs> IMDb picture. Oh yeah. Okay, Fault <laughs> and, and the Cub. He was married to um Mary Elizabeth Weinstead. Holy moly, for <laughs> yeah. real? Can you believe that? They got divorced That's in twenty seventeen. But yeah. We were just talking about Scott Pilgrim. That's weird. That That's is crazy. <laughs> Yeah, but he directed Faults and The Cub. The Cub might be um might be a short. Yeah. Yeah, it it's a short. So he's made two features. And so in Faults uh, Weinstead is in Faults as well. I'd say this is great for a second film. Oh, yeah. Oh, to see yeah, what he does next. really really uh a, a supreme second film. Yeah. I think uh um, I, I, I really would be interested in watching his first film and mm-hmm. I'll be very excited to see what's coming up next because I, I think this movie performed well enough to where uh, he shouldn't have too much trouble uh, getting funding for uh, another low bu- lower budget project. Right. Um, I'd agree. However, you know, Martin Scorsese couldn't get funding for The Irishman, so... <laughs> who knows? Who we'll knows? See. Yeah, it we got, will see. Um, Two point four million at the box office. What was that compare? What was the budget? Do you know? I'm looking it up right now. Let's see. Um. Hmm. Doesn't say the budget on here. It just says box office. But I I can't imagine this cost a lot to make. It it seems pretty uh relatively low budget. You know, I mean, of course. Yeah, it's just the Eisenberg though. True. Uh, I mean, I'm not. I don't think it's any clerks or anything of like made on a shoestring budget. Um, but I certainly, you know, there's there's mid budget films, and I don't even think this one was all the way to mid budget. Is my guess, but I don't know. Oh, hmm. I have a question that um, I I was talking to one of my other uh, film friends. And he brought this up. Um, do you think that because of... Okay. So, coronavirus is really fucking up uh, 
movie production and all of that. Mm-hmm. How do you think that it'll change like the types of movies that are be- going to be made or do you think that there'll just be a gap for like a year? I uh I'm certainly holding out hope that it's all just going to be a gap mm-hmm. uh and we're going to come right back into the full swing of things as soon as, you know, quarantine's fully, you know, as soon as the vaccines made uh, in however many months they say it's going to be made or whatever. Um, uh, I think the real uh, tell that we're going to see is uh, specifically I'm I'm holding uh, the Green Knight as a measuring stick. Um, I don't know if y'all have heard uh, anything about the Green Knight, but it's uh, an A24 movie that's uh, coming up and it's probably their their biggest hyped film right mm-hmm. now that's uh you know uh incoming as it yeah. were um and uh i've been following its production and it was supposed to be released i think it was supposed to re- be released sometime this month or uh next month maybe Mm -hmm. Uh, and they're currently not sure when they're going to release it, but uh, A24 and the director uh, really, really believe in the theater-going experience, and they really, really, really don't want to release it in theaters, but at the same time, I think he said something along the lines of, you know, he'd rather it be released at home than not released at all you Mm -hmm. know what i mean yeah you know a home a home viewing while people really need it right now might be better than waiting you know a year or so to release Mm -hmm. it in the theaters yeah because Um, i think like the highest grossing movie of the year right now is like bad boys three or something like that That and that's just makes because sense. that it like came out during quarantine and people were waiting to watch it, I guess. Right. Uh-huh. The other thing huh. that uh, this person uh, said, as I forget like the specific reason reasoning of why, and I guess I'll have to go back and try and find it so I can ask you guys again. But they were wondering if, because of uh, like if some reason because of quarantine and. Um, sort of like Netflix and uh, like uh, had on demand video or whatever that you might start to see uh, sort of like lower to meet more lower or medium budget films hmm. that like sort of branch out um, genres I guess I think because like either you get like the big production company films or you get or like some like A24 stuff or you just get like s- stuff that like people right out of college make and right i'm wondering if like because of sort of like how coronavirus is, like might change the industry and because of like the prevalence of on-demand video that like some of that might change mm-hmm. yeah well i think, I think sorry you go first carter I think it's all up to how much money that they can make off of putting the movies like on demand as soon as they come out because if and I think that's what they're testing right now, like that um, new animated Scooby Doo movie is going straight to uh, straight to online, and I think they're just taking this moment to try to test and see whether that's going to be profitable for the companies. And if it is, yeah. then maybe they'll just move on to doing that, and it'll go the same way as like video games have gone with like GameStop. A movie theater could be seen as GameStop. Like, why would I go do that when I can just get the movie online right now? You know. Yeah. So my argument here uh, is, for starters, I, I don't think they have a control. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. They, they really don't have a test of um, whether it's profitable to go straight to on demand when we have the option of going to the theater instead. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. So I'd be interested to see what would happen if they make a movie right and put it out online at the same time as it's out in the theaters. Uh, And we've already seen that a little bit with piracy, you know what I mean? People are Mm -hmm. very likely to pirate, and it's always Sonny did that episode on it. 
uh, with Thunder Gun 3 or whatever. Right. Um, and so I think that since even though piracy is rampant, you know, and even though streaming services is rampant, there's a reason, well, there are multiple reasons why A Marriage Story and Roma were shown in theaters as well as put directly on Netflix. And I think, uh, you know, the main reason for that is uh, to get it into film festivals, right? And get Mm -hmm. it uh, to be allowed for the criteria of, uh, you know, the award ceremonies. But the other thing is, is I think they certainly... um, made money off of those uh and i think people still really value going to see things in theaters because my grandparents haven't had netflix up until now right Right. and they're big movie lovers um and they went out to see a marriage story in theaters you know Mm -hmm. um and so i i really am gonna argue that Yes, I think more and more we're going to see the rise of that mid-budget uh, film. That goes like, straight uh, which to is, on-demand. Uh, no, not necessarily straight to on-demand, but specifically in streaming services. I think streaming services are going more and more towards those mid-budget movies. Yeah, that's, that's um, what I meant. Like, straight to streaming. Um. And even then, I, I still think those mid-budget movies seem to do pretty all right in the box office as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, they're, uh, probably like 10 years ago or so, there was this idea of, you know, you know the mid-budget movie was pretty much erased. And it was like, you know, if they're going to spend a lot of movie, they might as well throw as many explosions and crazy things and as many stars and all of that as they can at the movie um, or just make it on a shoestring budget, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, But I think we're seeing uh, a bigger rise in that mid-budget film. Uh, And I think I'm also completely stealing these words from somebody else I talked to. (laughs) Um, So I'm just going to say that just so that nobody thinks I'm I'm that genius of the film (laughs) industry. Yeah, I actually think I know exactly who told me all this. Uh, a brother of one of my friends who has uh, been working in the industry for a while, holding X number of random jobs in the industry huh. uh, and all that. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm not that worried that theater's going to die out. Oh, I theaters don't think are theaters gonna are going to die out. out. Because, like... but. People will always want to see the newest Star Wars or Fast and the Furious movie on the biggest screen that they can. Right. Mm -hmm. But, Mm. like, um, like, for lower budget movies, or, like, movies like this, like, it, it, like, I don't think that they necessarily would have, like, if they had had, if it, if they had had an option to not release on the screen, and it would have been cheaper or it, they would have made like a comparable amount of money, then they probably would have done that option. And if that option is there and there's an audience there, then that might lead to more mid-level budget movies being made. Mm-hmm. The one thing I I am interested in is the economics of going straight to DVD because I don't think they're losing any money by... Uh, sending it out to theaters right because the theaters buy the movie to show right they buy the rights to the movie you Mm -hmm. know what i mean uh these movies don't make money based on ticket sales that's how the theaters make money uh and the theaters also mostly make their money off concessions right yeah Um, right well if they don't make money off of ticket sales then if they can get all of that money just from putting it um, on like Netflix or their own proprietary streaming service, then that just opens up a lot of money to be made, and that cuts out the yeah. middleman. The the reason why they don't have their own streaming services, you know, there's a reason why there isn't like a TriStar streaming service and all of that. Um, back in the day, uh, um, 
movie the the movie industry was an entire monopoly, right? Yeah. They owned the theaters, they owned every part of production and there is a third thing I think. I think they also own distribution or something like that, okay. right? Well, yeah, but Netflix also produces and and like puts out their own movies too. They they make the right. movies and distribute them too. But on a much smaller scale than Universal I'm or not Columbia. About Universal. But I'm what talk- I'm saying is is that they declared that it was a monopoly and they declared that uh, you know the movie industry was gonna have to give up one of these facets, mm-hmm. so they gave up theaters. No, I know. But right? then Disney also has Disney Plus and all the newest Avengers movies are on Disney Plus. Right? That's just that's mm-hmm. distribution. But all of those Disney movies that are going on to Disney Plus, uh, you know, most of those things are also shown in the theaters. The only thing they really have, you know, that's full monopoly is like The Mandalorian and any of their other shows and things that are direct to their streaming service, which I don't think there are that many right now, but I think National Treasure Three will be. <laughs> I think, yeah, if they could, if it would make them more money and they could, they would definitely move to just putting movies on Disney Plus and they'd phase out the theaters. But I and think I, that I think they... I think they future. make more money with theaters because as well as getting, you know, DVD or streaming sales, right, they're mm-hmm. also getting um, the sales of movie tickets and so the only thing i might think of how they might make more money is if you know netflix really thinks that um you know it's that advantageous that no one can see this movie anywhere other than on netflix and they're gonna get that many more viewers right and more paying subscribers by having it only on netflix that they would rather spend more money to prevent it from going to the theaters, which I don't think the amount of money they would spend to buy it is comparable to the amount of money they would make from theaters. Hmm. But again, I am not an expert in this field, and I'm not an expert in economics, so... Well, just thinking I about guess it, I'm, logically, if they have to go with the theaters, then you're then you're already splitting it with another person. And well, they're not it's... splitting it. The way they do it is the theaters buy the movie. So whether the theater sells 250 tickets or zero tickets, the, 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 um, the movie has already made its money, right? So each theater decides what they think they're going to be able to sell the most tickets and concessions for. And then they Mm -hmm. buy that movie, and based on how well it does each week, you know what I mean? They either add more screenings or take away screenings, and from there, you make more or less money, right? Gotcha. Mm -hmm. To the best of my knowledge. So basically, as as we all said, this all just boils down to economics. Mm. Yep. Well, I'm going to say that's a fine note to end, end the show on. Yeah. All right. Well, it was Thank good talking to you boys. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Our next week, uh, next episode is on Nightcrawler Network and A Face in the Crowd. We'll be going over all three. It'll probably end up being a long episode, so that'll be interesting. I imagine there'll be a lot to talk about over three movies. So right. stay tuned. Right. Thank y'all for having me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks Carter. for being on the show, Carter. Yeah. No problem. All right. Love talking movies. <laughs> Love talking movies. <laughs> All right. Talk to y'all later. See you. See ya. Bye. Uh, let's do an intro with a. <laughs> if you said goodbye to <laughs> oh, me God. tonight. Ooh, <laughs> I did not sign up for that. <laughs>